So welcome to today's video on things I wish I knew when I started out in cybersecurity. Now, first up, we've got job application requirements. They really are just a wish list for most companies. They know they're not going to get everything on that list. They want to get as close to what's on that list as possible, but they will accept less. Now, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking this is the requirements. If you don't meet all of the criteria, then you're not going to get the job. And that is simply not the case for a lot of companies. A lot of these companies are really, really struggling to hire people and they will go for even one of the things on the list. So if you think, okay, I don't meet everything on the list or maybe I meet a couple of things or even I don't meet anything on the list, but I think I could get to that position very quickly, then just apply. It doesn't really cost anything to just send out your job application to a few extra companies. And maybe their dream candidate dropped out. Maybe they took another job which was better paid and now they're struggling to fill that role and you're the next best thing. You never really know who else is applying for the jobs, so you can't know that you don't meet their criteria. Now, next up is don't discount small companies. This actually feeds a little into the past point, which is a lot of these big companies are not only using like automated resume filtering and probably won't read your resume if it doesn't contain certain keywords, they also have ridiculous requirements like degrees or more experience in a technology than that technology has been around for. But it's not just that. At smaller companies, you're going to feel like you're part of the team, like you actually have real influence on the direction of a project. Whereas at big companies, you're going to feel more like a cog in a machine that you just feed your work into this black hole and you never really know where it goes. And you can get a feeling of like you're actually doing something at these big companies, but it usually comes with a leadership role. Whereas I worked at a very small company. I was one of maybe five people on my team and I could see the product of my work. I could do something. I could see it integrated into the product and it just felt like my work was much more valuable. And just because it's a small company, they're not going to pay you less. I actually make the same at a small company that I would at a uh, like a big tech company. So I really recommend not discounting these small companies. Don't be like me. I nearly didn't take the job that I have now. Uh, I looked at the company and I was like, wow, I've, I've never heard of them. I want to work for the Microsofts and the Facebooks and the Apples and the Googles. And then I ended up giving them a chance because I was like, I didn't have a job at the time and I needed something to like tide me over until I could get the job I wanted. And I actually found out that this job is the job I wanted. And now I've had offers from big tech companies like Microsoft, Cisco, and I have no intention of leaving because the job is just so much better where I am. Now, next up is don't be deterred by gatekeepers. Now, gatekeepers are people who will try and tell you you're not good enough. But most of the time they are doing this because they doubt themselves. They're basically trying to make themselves feel better by telling other people they're not good enough and that they, they won't make it in the industry because then if those people are turned away, it gives the person in question a, a better chance at moving up in the field. And most of the time, pretty much all of the time, these people are at the very bottom of the field. They're kind of, they're the underperformers, the people who just aren't very good. And they basically, they have to try and push people out of the field because they're, they're scared that this will impact their own career. And you will run into them pretty much immediately if you go on social media into like infosec discords and just do not be disheartened. Don't even listen to them because most of them are really doing it out of insecurity. There's pretty much an endlessly ongoing debate about whether you need a degree to make it an infosec. And the answer is unquestionably you don't, but people will swear on your life that you have to have a degree else you're not going to make it in the field. And I'm currently a partner at a tech company. I'm not even like a low-level employee. I am a partner and I never had any formal qualifications. I never went for a degree. I never went for certifications. I know not only can you make it, but actually how easy it is with the right path. Now, following on from that, the right path. So there is no right path for everyone. The right path is the path that works for you. You will find a lot of people telling you that, oh, you have to go this way. You have to go to college. You have to get a degree. Then you have to start as an intern. And you've got other people saying, oh, just like start your own company. And the truth is there is no path into InfoSec. In fact, out of all of the industries I've seen, InfoSec is the most diverse. If you look at, say, the medical industry, then a lot of people are going to come from uh, like a med school background. When it comes to InfoSec, when I started out, there were not 
InfoSec qualifications. There weren't certifications, there weren't degrees. The closest you could get is a computer science course, which would be wholly useless for InfoSec. And as a result, a lot of people come from a lot of different backgrounds. Like cybersecurity pretty much touches the entire industry. I know people who were uh, IT support at schools and their schools got hacked. And then they, they started looking into the cybersecurity side of like school administration. I know people who are farmers who basically got in through the, the tech side of farming. And it's the same with the medical field. You have a lot of people who come from like a, a medical background. They went to med school and then they got interested in the security of medical devices and they sort of pivoted slowly into cybersecurity, obviously bringing their understanding of medical technology with them. And we need all of these people. We need people who have medical backgrounds who understand medical technology. And we need farmers who understand farm machinery because we're just doing security. We don't know how the stuff necessarily works. We don't know the use cases and it's very easy in infosec to say oh we should do this for security we should like prohibit users from doing this and then you find out that this is a very common use case which actually makes the user's jobs untenable so i recommend listening to the advice from these people on what they think the best path is just to get ideas of what you think might work for you but don't pretend you have to take that path just think, oh, that actually sounds like a good idea. Maybe I'll go and do that. Like, oh, they they went and got a, a simple free certification to boost their knowledge. Maybe I'll go do that. Or they watched YouTube videos. Maybe I'll go do that. But don't, if you like find yourself trying to follow someone else's path, especially if it's clearly not working for you, know that there is no set path. You can really just get in the industry in whichever way you want. Now, next up is salaries. Salaries are going to be quite confusing for a lot of reasons in InfoSec. And one of the common things with tech is tech is a very rapidly growing industry. And that means that salaries grow too. Uh, the tech industry is constantly in need of new tech people. So that means offering more and more money for new employees. And what we've actually created is this reverse weighted system where the longer you've been at a company, the less you're going to make because those people were hired like back in the, the 90s and early 2000s when tech wasn't as big of a thing. So um, tech was kind of seen as like IT roles. So maybe those people are making 50, 60K a year in the US. And then tech started becoming big tech. So a lot of those people just, they stayed in their roles. They worked at the same company for 10 years, making 50, 60,000 a year. And then the company is like, wow, we really need like more tech people. How can we incentivize more tech people? And they did that by offering salaries in the hundreds of thousands. So I've seen it at companies where you have people who are in their 50s have been working at the company for 20 years and they're making 60K a year. Then you have this fresh out of college grad who is making like 250K a year. And this actually feeds into kind of a distortion of salary expectations because often sites like Glassdoor, people don't really want to publish their salaries while they're still working at a company because although it is illegal, there is a risk that they retaliate against you for doing that. So people typically post their reviews of companies and their salaries once they leave. Now, most of the people who are leaving are going to be the, uh, the older generations who are fed up with their 50 and 60k salaries while others are making 200k so they're going to leave they're going to report their salaries to sites like glassdoor and as a result salary range you're going to see on these sites might actually be significantly lower than what the the new grads are getting at that company so it's important to actually talk to people working at the company especially people who have recently started don't make the mistake of assuming that the longer someone's been at the company then the more they're going to make because that's actually not the case so talk to some people who started recently in the past one to two years and ask them for their salaries because that will give you a much better idea of what the actual salary ranges are versus what the salaries were 10 to 20 years ago when the older generations working there got hired. Now in another point sort of leading on from that one is salary is not the entire picture. A lot of tech jobs are comped with stocks or bonuses. So you'll find even for really high-end jobs salaries will often sit around the 100 to 150k mark with the rest coming in compensation. And there's all kinds of benefits for that especially taxes so it's important to look at the whole package and not just the salary because comp is very different to other industries. But I see a lot of jobs where the salary is the minority of what you get paid. It'll be something like 45% salary and then 
maybe half bonuses, half stock. And it's very rare that you'll actually see a salary which is even more than half of the total compensation. Now, one point is while you don't specifically need anything at all to actually get into InfoSec, there are things which can help. Certifications can definitely like boost your credibility. Being able to program will boost like your ability to work. You'll be able to automate things and that adds a lot of value to you as a person. So I recommend looking at job requirements as not a requirement, but cross-referencing between different job applications and trying to get an idea for what would be helpful. Those aren't going to be things you need, but if you see a skill popping up on like lots and lots of job applications, then you can increase your value by going away and learning that skill. A language like Python is incredibly versatile, incredibly useful. It'll boost how much you're worth. And also it's a door to programming in general. So you can start out with Python, which is a very easy language, get a bit of an understanding for programming and then pivot into the real kind of heavy programming. Now, finally, there is more to the industry than just hacking. A lot of people wanting to get into cybersecurity think of hacking, they go for red teaming or pen testing. And you might actually find even if you are really interested in hacking that those jobs are very boring because it's all, it's simulated stuff, it's testing. It's not going to be the hacking you think of when you think professional hacker. And those jobs do exist, but they're kind of hard to find. They might actually not be in the spaces you think they are. Now, I definitely recommend looking further than just red teaming and pen testing. If that's really what you want to be, then go for it. But you're probably going to find out it's not what you think it is. And also, those are the two most oversaturated industries in InvoSec because that is what everyone thinks of when they think of hacking. They think, I'm going to be a pen tester. I'm going to be a red teamer. And as a result, Everyone who wants to get into the industry starts out with those two. So there is a lot of competition. I actually went the threat intelligence route and I found out I was doing way more hacking related stuff than red teamers or pen testers. But I was now in an industry where there is an insane competition and it isn't super saturated. And I never really saw a reason to go back. Like I originally wanted to be a pen tester. And now that I found the industry that I actually enjoy, I have no interest in being a pen tester or a red teamer. So that's my short list of things I wish I knew. Um, I'm probably going to come up with more of these and maybe do another video later. I hope this helps some people who are looking to get into the industry or maybe people who are already in the industry and are looking where to pivot or how to boost their skills.